Hello, I'm Jorge Gestoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, what happened with the climate change in this year, 2018? Our guest, Javier Sierra, spokesman of the Sierra Club, the largest environmental organization in the United States. Javier Sierra, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Javier, how would you assess the situation of the climate change in the year 2018? Well, from the, uh, the U.S. point of view, obviously, it has been a very intense year. We've seen a lot of good things and quite a few bad things, too. For example? For example, uh, the, the person uh, occupying the, uh, the house that is right behind you. The White House? Is the, obviously, uh, he has uh, become the biggest uh, obstacle in the fight against uh, climate change in the whole world. During the Obama administration, the United States was the leader, the world leader in the fight against climate change. Right now, we're the biggest obstacle. But even so, we have seen remarkable, extraordinary advances in, in, this, in this respect. You separate the federal government of the U.S. to other governments. Tell us. Obviously, uh, at the federal government, we've, been, we've seen this administration trying to undermine and to roll back all the protections that are uh, um, the, the water protections, the air protections, the protection of our climate, and so forth. But a completely different story is taking place at the state, local, and municipal level in the United States. Uh, the advances that have, have been, as I said before, extraordinary. And the, the uh, em most emblematic example in this regard, obviously, is California. California, if it were an independent country, it would be the fifth economy in the world. And California has committed itself to 100% clean and renewable energy in the future. This is really something extraordinary from the sense that uh, the most powerful, the most, the richest state in the United States making this kind of commitment is, is uh, absolutely something, uh, um, uh, headline news, I would say. Let's just make this, uh, if, the, if California can do such a thing, so can any other state in the United States and any, o any other advanced country in the world. You're the expert and you're saying we are facing a planetarium emergency. The climate change is already here. The President of the United States has a quite opposite view. Say, this is a Chinese hoax. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, this uh, really uh, traumatic and, and terrible thing taking place right now. However, uh, as much as he is pushing for uh, this uh, 19th century fuel to come back, coal, and uh, all the things that his administration is doing in terms of uh, favoring the uh, dirty, the dirty uh, f uh, fuels industry, oil, coal, gas, and so forth. At the state, local, and municipal level, we've seen an incredible, incredible counterpunch against all these things. Uh, the, the, advancement, the advancement has been, as a matter of fact, California has already met its uh, uh, Paris uh, Agreement uh, goals. Um, Right now, in, in the United States, we have reached the lowest point in terms of consumption of uh, fossil fuels in 100 years. So the advancements are there, whether that person in the White House likes it or not. And you're mentioning that in the last decade, we're talking about from the year 2008 to today, the cost of the clean energy dropped by 98%? Um, that has been absolutely amazing, the way this, uh, the, the advancements in this, in this sense have been in the U.S. and many other parts, parts of the country. Um, uh, let's say if a megawatt of uh, coal energy is $100, a, meg a megawatt of uh, solar or wind is half or less than that. Uh, right now, the cheapest way of genera generating electricity in any part of the world is solar panels. Uh, in, in some places, for instance, there was a, there's an array that is being built in Mexico. Right now, a kilowatt an hour is going to cost 3.5 cents of a dollar. Ten years ago, it would have cost ten times that amount of money. So we've seen this as exponential. We've seen that uh, the international energy markets are realizing that clean energy is much cheaper, much more affordable, and much faster in order to come online. So how would you explain to someone who is watching this uh, conversation that uh, the administration of Trump is defending the coal uh, energy or the coal industry? And how will be your reaction to the fact that two key members of his cabinet, we're talking about the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and now the Secretary of Interior, the two of them 
are leaving the White House, and the two of them are involved in um, corruption or questionable behavior during their tenure, and the two of them were against climate change. How do how you explain that? What we're seeing here is the levels of corruption that are unprecedented. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this in our lifetimes or in the uh, modern history of the United States. These two agencies are key in order to fight climate change, in order to open the doors to a clean and renewable energy economy. Uh, and these two are uh, obviously the worst, the worst behavior that we've seen is in, the, in uh, the heads of these two, uh, these two uh, departments. For instance, at the EPA, uh, Scott Pruitt, this person was so corrupt that even <laughs> the White House had to intervene and say, please leave. Um, at the uh, Interior Department, for instance, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the current uh, Secretary, uh, Ryan Sinke, uh, he is under 17 investigations, including one by the Department of Energy. We're talking about federal felonies, what we're, t what we're talking about here. So it is actually incredibly uh, disappointing and shameful that such, cor such corruption is taking root at these two crucial agencies to, uh, uh, to protect the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, and the climate for the next generation. The other side of the coin, sort of uh, some hopeful future in terms of there is, we're talking about a green pact and you were mentioning three issues of that green pact you're mentioning the renovation of the infrastructure also preparing everything that is a construction buildings houses to be more energy efficient and also you're mentioning to buy clean tell us about what is the, the green pact about and who is behind that uh, this is an initiative that came up uh, after the, uh, the elections, the, uh, the November elections, the parliamentary elections here, um, because there's, there's a new um, a generation of politicians, thank goodness, representing millennials and other uh, um, um, young people in the United States that have realized that what, we, what people of our generation, what we're doing is we, we actually uh, potentially destroying their future. This is something that is, is not only wrong, it's also immoral, okay? And what they're trying to do is uh, put forward this program that uh, uh, buying clean means that uh, uh, governments at any level, federal, local, municipal, whatever, they have a lot of uh, um, uh, power in terms of uh, buying clean fleets of, uh, of uh, buses, uh, public transportation, uh, weatherizing all these, uh, the buildings and so forth that can save a tremendous amount of energy and also um, open the doors of, uh, of a clean energy economy that uh, it is happening in the United States, but unfortunately not at the federal level right now. We have seen uh, incredible uh, fires, wildfires and droughts. Does, is it a relationship between climate change and we, what we are experiencing or suffering in the U.S.? Obviously, uh, the, the scientists tell us that uh, climate change uh, have a multiplying factor in terms of the intensity of these storms, the intensity of these wildfires, the intensity of these droughts. And, uh, and I'll give you an example of uh, the, uh, the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. It was as if, as if a nuclear bomb just landed in the center of the island. It was completely devastated. Uh, and the reason why this is is because uh, um, the, the fuel of a hurricane is the high temperature of the water. The higher the temperature, the more powerful it becomes. It's something that, for instance, what happened, I was saying in Maria in Puerto Rico, or what happened with uh, Michael in, uh, in the Panhandle in Florida. I mean, uh, Jorge, thank goodness this thing landed on a, a sparsely populated part of the country. But you see that uh, after this thing, this, this monster uh, passed through these communities, you didn't even see the, uh, the rest of the homes uh, it was amazing. It was completely flattened. leveled. Yeah. Um, and why? Because the and, and this uh, hurricane uh, in particular, it, it, it got to category five in record time. Why? Because the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, the temperature is very high. Therefore, it's like fuel. It's the fuel that actually uh, makes these uh, uh, storms uh, turn them into these monsters. So we are suffering climate change already. Of course, the climate change is already happening. The crisis is already with us, and we are already paying the consequences. Uh, there was a st federal study uh, in the past uh, few years 
um, the, uh, the, the cost, the economic cost of uh, hurricanes is, is already uh, around $350, $400 uh, billion here in the United States. That's why insurance company and other, uh, other parts of the economy that actually had to put up with that kind of uh, uh, incredible uh, cost are saying, ladies and gentlemen, we have to do something about this. This cannot continue this way. Javier, in recent days in Poland, a uh, climate meeting regarding uh, implementation of the climate change in Paris mm -hmm. and sponsored by the UN. Your, your conclusions. Well, we at the beginning we had a uh, mixed feelings, obviously, because the uh, the Trump administration treated this crucial, crucial uh, climate summit as if it were a, a, a trade show, a trade fair, and they sent <laughs> representatives of the uh, coal industry to sell this uh, 19th century fuel, as if nothing were happening in in the planet, as if we didn't have a planetary emergency because precisely of the burning of coal, oil, and other fossil fuels. But on the other hand, we saw levels of energy that were unprecedented, especially from the point of view of the youth. We saw this 12-year-old uh, from Sweden, Greta Thunberg, that actually gave an unbelievable lesson in morality to our generation and all these coal representatives and all these coal salespeople in, in Katowice. And they were saying, you guys are stealing our future. You guys keep thinking about the earnings of the next quarter when we're talking about 10, 15 years from now, we're talking about the future of humanity. Uh, the way the youth uh, uh, posed this problem in Poland was re something re really extraordinary. Why? Because they were talking from the moral point of view. They were talking from a, a moral high ground that the, uh, the Trump administration or whatever they sent to sell coal, they don't have it. So and that was something to be admired, and that was something that made us really proud. And the next step is in 2020 to follow up this meeting? Yes, uh, obviously what they had to do, they had to monitor the advance uh, in terms of uh, meeting the goals of the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, agreement back in, that were established in 2012. Uh, I mean, you can commit yourself to um, whatever ambitious a goal could be, but you had to actually uh, 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 fulfill these commitments and uh, every year um, these commitments need to be monitored and see whether or not are being fulfilled by the, all the signatories of the, of the because agenda. the big deal is or the big um, goal is not to let in this century increase the temperature of this planet for over 1.5 Celsius degrees yeah and in order to to avoid that in order to keep uh, the temperature not, uh, not, not uh, um, higher than 1.5 uh, degrees is uh, the United Nations and the science of, uh, scientists of the world, they tell us, the only way to do this is to give at least two thirds of the uh, world reserves of fossil fuels in the ground, not burning them. That's the only way we could do this. Also, uh, the United Nations gave us a really stark warning uh, a couple of months ago, it told us we have only 12 years to uh, drastically reduce uh, the amount of fossil fuels that we burn in order to avoid the catastrophic consequences of climate change. This is a planetary emergency we are right now. And it's, real, it's really immoral um, on the part of uh, the Trump administration that not, they're not treating this as such. So the good thing, as we said before, obviously, is that aside from the federal level in the United States, we are we're making tremendous advancements in terms of uh, fighting climate change. We are watching this interview from uh, somewhere in Latin America. Why should I care? Well, I should I care because Latin America, as many other uh, emerging regions in the world, are the ones who contributed the least to the climate crisis that we have right now, and the ones who have suffered the worst consequences of climate change. Uh, according to the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, uh, the whole region is spending 4.5 percent of the GDP in uh, mitigating the uh, consequences of uh, the climate crisis that are taking place right now, not in the future. So that leaves very little room for these emerging e economies to grow because that's an, an, an unbelievable amount of money, an unbelievable amount of resources dedicated to mitigating instead of preparing uh, those countries 
for what is going to take place in the future. We are seeing a migration crisis yes. coming from Central America and being in the middle of the political discussion here in Washington and all over the country. Is there any relationship between the massive migration of Central Americans and climate change? Yes, there is. Unfortunately, this is, uh, this is one of the factors that has discussed the least. But uh, um, uh, climate change is one of the triggers, and probably one of the most important triggers. In the past two years, um, these three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, have uh, gone through horrible droughts that have uh, uh, caused the collapse of the crops. And in many instances, uh, these uh, farmers are, are, are uh, dedicating themselves to subsistence uh, agriculture. When you have this, uh, uh, climatological con uh, climate conditions is almost impossible to su to survive. And what happens when they see that the uh, the crops are ruined? They head north. According to a study by the World Bank, in the next uh, 10, 20 years, um, uh, around four million Central Americans will head north because of the consequences of the climate crisis. You were mentioning that the arrival to the presidency of Brazil of uh, Jair Bolsonaro is a step backwards regarding climate change. Unfortunately, this uh, gentleman uh, also is a climate change denier. He says that the whole thing, uh, he's uh, uh, with his uh, compadre uh, Trump, he says the whole thing is un cuento chino. Uh, uh, Chinese hoax. Yeah, Chinese hoax. Um, um, one of the, the worst things that this uh, gentleman has said is that uh, he's going to open the, uh, the forest, uh, the uh, the Amazon uh, to uh, log in and other uh, uh, commercial uh, exploitations. Um, uh, the Amazon is uh, one of the lungs of the, of the planet. If he goes in that direction, obviously we're going to be in a lot of trouble. You were mentioning that there are four countries or three countries and, 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 and a group of countries that produces about 50 percent, half of the contamination of the world. Um, yeah, uh, it's the, uh, China, the United States, India, and the European Union are the lead, the lead uh, uh, polluters in terms of climate change in the, in the world. These also have been the uh, countries and regions of the world that have contributed the most to the climate crisis. And the ones who are going to, as we were saying before, the ones who are going to suffer the consequences the most will be countries like, like ours, the, the whole Latin American region and the Caribbeans are the ones who are going to be suffering the consequences. As we said before, the economic consequences already are dire. So um, and, and these countries, the advanced countries, the most advanced countries, advanced countries in the world are the ones who need to uh, step up actually and help the emerging uh, economies to first cope with uh, climate change and get ready for the consequences of the climate, uh, climate crisis in the future. You were mentioning the, the youth. You're, you were impressed in, in that meeting, uh, the summit in Poland, about the reaction of the, of the youth, especially NGOs represented by young people. But you also you were impressed by the youth here. And you have a personal an anecdote regarding uh, how the youth is feeling this uh, threat. Obviously, for, for the uh, uh, newer generations, the climate change is an existential crisis. Uh, what we're talking about is that we're dealing with the, the, uh, the survival of humanity in the future. Uh, we saw this incredible energy at the uh, climate summit in, in Poland. And uh, to give you an example, uh, m my daughter, when she was seven, we were at this, uh, on this beach in, in the Delaware coast here in the U.S. We were watching the waves, and she just came to me, held my hand, and out of the blue, she just said, uh, uh, Papa, when I grow up, I want to be a marine ecologist. I said, well, all right, well, let's see the, I mean, seven years old, they say something like that, well, let's see what happens. It was just a year and a half ago, she graduated from one uh, top of university. In Congratulations. The Thank you very much, as a marine ecologist, and, uh, and she remains fully committed to fight in the climate change and the climate crisis because what she is dealing with is her own future. I mean, if you and I were in, in her position, we would be exactly doing exactly the same thing. Your generation and mine is the last one that can do some significant, excuse me, in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, climate crisis. And uh, we have seen in the midterm election, in the past midterm elections in November, many of uh, young 
representatives that are going to be participating in the House of Representatives that for the first time in eight years is going to be with the majority of the Democrats. And you, you have detected a different attitude of those young representatives regarding climate change? Yes, and it's called the, new, uh, the Green New Deal. Um, and this is an initiative that is pushing uh, the hardest by obviously by the youngest and the most progressive members of the House of Representatives that have been just elected. Right now, the voters send them to Capitol Hill to do something about climate change, to do something really significant. And in this, in this instance, this New Deal, new, uh, Green New Deal, obviously, is, uh, is going to be a three-pronged strategy that is going to uh, open, uh, wide open the, uh, uh, the new uh, economy or gre green uh, renewable energy. Uh, is going gonna, is gonna to force uh, state, local, and municipal um, um, governments in terms of uh, um, buying green. And also, is, uh, uh, of course, what we're talking about is the, the infrastructures of the country, we need, uh, the, which is crumbling in many instances. We see fair world level of uh, infrastructure here in the United States in too many instances. And where we have to take advantage of this, invest in this, in this, uh, in this new infrastructure and make it resilient and make it prepare for what we're going to see in the future because of the climate uh, crisis. Javier Sierra, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Jorge. Enjoy our program.